Hello, my name is Natalia Kelly and this presentation is on glare, the functional impact of glare on vision and strategies to reduce glare within the environment to improve functional vision. Glare is when vision is impaired in the presence of a bright light. More specifically, glare occurs when light when the light source, either the sun, from the sun or artificial light, produces a luminance that is greater than the eye can adapt to. The most common causes of glare are when light is seen either directly from its source or light is seen via reflection. Therefore, glare is commonly known as direct glare when the light source is in the direct line of sight and indirect glare which is also known as reflected glare, when there is difficulty seeing in the presence of a bright light being reflected off a surface. In addition to the causes of glare, there are different forms of glare that can impact on functional vision. These include discomfort glare, where visual function is unaffected by viewing, but viewing is uncomfortable and in some cases can cause pain. Its occurrence is immediate and arises from the light source or the luminaires whose luminance is greater than the eye can adapt to. The physical parameters that cause the degree of discomfort glare are the luminance of the glare source and the angle from the observer, the background luminance and the size and position of the glare source to the observer. An example of discomfort glare is when you're outside on a bright sunny day and the daylight is too bright causing you to squint. Usually you would pop on some sunglasses to gain some relief. Disability glare on the other hand causes an actual reduction in visual performance. There is reduced visibility of what is seen due to a, the presence of a light source within the visual field. It occurs when the light source from the glare source is scattered by, by the ocular media, in particular the cornea and the lens. This scattered light forms a veil of luminance which reduces the contrast and thus the visibility of the target. Disability glare can be so intense that it can cause, that it could actually be blinding and when this occurs it's known as blinding glare. An example of disability glare is when you're driving at night and the headlights from the cars approaching in the opposite direction are shining directly into your eyes. So here we have an instance that reflects both direct glare from the opposite headlights and also disability glare, which causes your eyesight to be disabled and you have great difficulty seeing the road in front of you. Finally, there's distracting glare. This is when there is annoyance created by the light source. An example of this is when you're using a light for reading and the light source is positioned at eye level. Whilst you're reading, you can see the, the light from the lamp in your peripheral vision causing you to be distracted from the task at hand. It may even cause you annoyance. It is well documented in the literature that glare becomes an increasing problem as we age. This is due to the nature of the aging eye and the common and and how it commonly degenerates and causes visual discomfort from glare. A study by Rubin and colleagues in 1993 indicated that people with ocular pathologies that cause an increase of light scatter within the eye experience exaggerated impairments under conditions of glare. Disability glare is prominent in those who have corneal and lens opacities, such as cataracts, corneal opacification or keratoconus. It is also a common problem with people who have retinal pathologies. It is explained in the literature um, that Strong stimulation of one large area of the retina affects the sensitivity of other regions in the retina. Individuals with macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy predominantly report glare sensitivity. 
To understand the physiological side of glare and its association with vision, please note the intraocular light scatter percentiles in a normal eye. So we have about 30% um, produced from the cornea, 70 from the lens, and less than 1% from the aqueous and the vitreous. So you can understand that in the light of an ocular pathology, glare would be an influential factor in the functional vision abilities. The effects of disability glare ha has been investigated in numerous studies. It is widely accepted that contrast sensitivity is specifically reduced from light scatter into the eye. The correlation between reduced contrast, contrast sensitivity due to glare in those with ophthalmic pathology was significantly high. The, the jury's still out on whether or not glare has a direct impact or there is a direct color correlation with visual acuity. However, the literature supports that there is a reduction in visual acuity secondary to reduced contrast sensitivity caused by light scatter and visual fatigue caused by glare. Visual fatigue due to glare causes a domino effect, dampering, dampening visual function and resulting in blurred vision. A study by Lynn and Associates in 2015 evaluated some evaluated eye movements and pupil size constriction under discomfort glare. The study found severe discomfort glare increased the speed of eye movements and caused large larger pupil constriction. There is, they also reported a larger variation of eye movements found amongst senior participants with a mean age of 61 years old as compared with their younger cohort with a mean age of 24 years. The authors found that these physical factors contributed to visual fatigue and eye strain. Glare can also temporarily impact on colour discrimination. The level of discrimination is also dependent on the comp on the complex interplay between the chromacy and of the glare source and that of the stimulus. Disability glare has been investigated in drivers and it was found that by some researchers that there was an increase in driver safety um, at night. So there was concerns about their, their safety at night. So severe disability glare is likely to affect aspects of mobility, such as reading street signs um, against a bright sky, detecting low contrast curbs or seeing objects when on white pavements when walking into the sun, although research has not been completely comprehensive in addressing these issues. Additionally, there is self-reported difficulties by patients with vision impairment, including reduced confidence with mobility, disorientation and confusion, particularly when there's an impact, when they're impacted by glare in unfamiliar environments. So it's important to be able to differentiate between someone who is glare sensitive and also someone who is photophobic. This differentiation is actually quite important um, when providing intervention strategies. So sometimes there can be a fine line between understanding when someone is glare sensitive and or photophobic. And you're likely to come across something like this when managing a patient with albinism, either ocular cutaneous or ocular albinism. Photophobia is when there is an extreme sensitivity to light and their visual function is impaired due to the imbalance of how much light is entering the eye and how much light can be absorbed by the eye. The visual impairment persists, albeit improves only slightly when glare is eliminated. Photophobia is also associated with accompanied blepharospasms 
um, or cortical blind or cortical headaches. Whereas in someone who is glare sensitive, their visual function improves um, greatly when glare is eliminate, eliminated uh, and when light is used appropriately, it can actually improve visual function. So before we look at intervention strategies, it's, first imp it's firstly important to look and identify what sources of glare are within the environment. By doing this, you're also identifying the types and forms of glare. So consider this picture here. It provides suggestions for percents, percentiles of light reflected off surfaces in a typical office environment. So window blinds reflect around 40 to 50% of light, walls around up to 50%. Um, again, business machines like photocopiers up to 50%, ceilings reflect up to 70 to 80%, floors 20 to 40%, um, given the floor coverings and the furniture as well, 20 to 45%. So when you're looking at the amount or the possibilities of reflected glare within an environment, there is quite a lot Um of glare to, to consider. So intervention strategies. The so intervention strategies can be broken up into three different categories. So by reducing the brightness ratio, so simple things like looking at popping some sunglasses on or covering um, your windows with window fixtures, lowering um the luminance levels within the environment as well uh, and or reducing the number of light fittings in use. You can also look at repositioning either the individual or the light source. So looking at relocating or repositioning um, where someone's sitting in regards to the amount of light, the, the light sources that are in the environment. Um, so here we're talking about instead of facing a window, we're sitting parallel to a window. We're also sitting in between um, light fixtures as well. Another option is looking at diffusion. So in a typical office environment, they commonly use uh, fluorescent lights. So we can look at uh, fluorescent or diffusers to cover overhead fixtures. Um, such as prismatic diffusers, uh, also the use of frosted or opal light globes either within the workplace or at home and non-reflective surfaces. Um, so if, we, if we're working on a tabletop that's quite reflective, looking at covering that with some matte finishes. So hopefully this presentation's given you uh, a comprehensive understanding of what glare is, um, how glare impacts on visual function and some strategies to help overcome that. Thank you.